It's my very great pleasure to introduce everybody's favourite master chef, Adam Lior, who will be the first of our snap lectures that we'll be having in this room all day today. Adam is a food columnist for Fairfax and The Guardian and the author of four hugely popular cookbooks on Asian cuisine, which are all for sale down in the foyer if anyone is interested in purchasing one later. On television, Adam hosts the SBS food and travel program Destination Flavour, which is now in its fourth season. He was the winner of the MasterChef Australia Blockbuster second series in 2010, which we all know was the best season, and he is also a qualified lawyer. Today, Adam will be talking about food trends, creativity and interpretation in his 15-minute lecture, which explores the age-old question, what is the difference between mu uh, muffins and cupcakes? But without further ado, please join me in welcoming Adam to the stage. Thank you all. And thank you for getting up so early on your Saturday morning to come and listen to the most ridiculous topic you could possibly chosen, have chosen from the entire schedule. But when the Wheeler Centre first contacted me some months ago asking whether I wanted to be involved in, in Terrabang, I was very quick to say yes because they said they were assembling some of the world's finest minds to answer some of the great questions of our time. How will the world end? Will artif artificial intelligence one day supersede native human intelligence? What are the frontiers of, of our species and perhaps even explore the one great question before us all, the meaning of life itself. So with that in mind, I'm here to talk to you about the difference between a fucking muffin and a cupcake. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you, before I got this email, I had not devoted one millisecond of my entire life to this as a topic. I can't even tell you the last time I ate either a muffin or a cupcake. Such is my lack of interest in this subject matter. To go further, I thought about emailing the Wheeler Centre to suggest changing the topic entirely or perhaps ignoring the question and just speaking about something that I was more interested in. There was one question about where did all the dead birds go, which I reckon I've got an answer to. <laughs> but then after thinking about it for a while, I had a, actually a really big change of heart. In fact, I decided it might be one of the most important questions that I ever answered, not because muffins and cupcakes are important, I really couldn't give a flying shit about them, but because this is exactly what the Interrobang is about. It's about the idea that every question deserves an answer, and sometimes the best question is the one that you never thought to ask in the first place. So with that, I'm going to answer the question, what is the difference between a muffin and a cupcake, with a straight bat. They even said to me yesterday, you don't have to talk about it, you can just talk about creativity or, or uh, food trends or something. I'm, I'm not, I'm going to talk about the difference between a muffin and a cupcake. So firstly, I'm going to answer it not once but three times because it actually has to be answered three times. And the first way I'm going to answer it is historically and etymologically. The term muffin came into common usage in the United Kingdom around the end of the 17th century. It came from the Low German Muffen, which means it's the plural of Muff, which is a small cake, so a number of small cakes. Muffins themselves go back much further to about the 10th or 11th century, where they were probably based on Viking flatbread, so originally coming from Sweden, Norway, Denmark, that area, over to England. Uh, but of course, this all refers to the English style of muffin, a flat piece of dough that's grilled or fried in a fry pan. Uh, and you can see why that was important. The benefits of, of, of muffin over bread, for example, is that without having to build an oven or wait for an oven to come to heat, which in those days could take hours, the ability to have an energy-rich, carbohydrate-based breakfast food that could be made in a pan over a single fire was actually a necessity. But that's not what this question is about. There is no confusion between an English muffin and a cupcake. We have to go forward a couple of hundred years to the American muffins and the confusion that may exist between an American muffin and an American cupcake. So, to the new world. They borrowed the name from the English predecessors, the muffin, but the original muffins in America were just small portions of leftover dough that were baked in small ramekins or pots. Cupcakes, on the other hand, came about in about the 19th century, coinciding with probably one of the least considered but most important changes in home cooking, and that was standardised volumetric measurement. Many people think that cupcakes got their name because they were baked in cups, which is possible but quite unlikely when you consider that baking a cake in a cup is a ridiculous thing to do. It's far more likely that cupcakes got their name from the transition from scales to volumetric measures, to cup measures. So we underestimate the impact of 
cup measures on cooking, but it was enormous. Before that, you had to make a cake of a particular size, bake it for a particular time. You couldn't, if you had 12 people over, you couldn't make a slightly larger cake because it would change everything uh, in the recipe. What cups, cup measures or volumetric measures allowed us to do was to have recipes, particularly in baking, based on proportions, which is huge. It was actually original, originally cupcakes were known as number cakes because of this. You could have one cup of milk, one cup of butter, two cups of sugar, three cups of flour and four eggs and that was the kind of standard way of making a cake and you could scale that from five people to 500 without having to change baking times, without having to, to think about anything else. But it was, it, it was hugely important. In Asia, where I am from, as you can tell, uh, it was even later than that, it was not until the kind of mid 20th century that we started to get standard volumetric measure. I remember as a kid not even uh, having cup measures. We, we used, uh, it wasn't until the colonial era where recipe measurements before that were based on the old Chinese system. I have old cookbooks that measure in catties and tails, a catty being about 600 grams and a tail being about 40 grams in today's money. After the colonial era, we started to use a measurement called cans. And this was about the same as a, well, exactly the same as a, a standard Australian cup measure. And it came about because the Nestle and Carnation milk companies started to sell condensed milk in 250 ml cans. The cans had a ring pull on them so you could take the top off the can, leaving no sharp edge, which meant the can could be reused. And that can measurement then was the one piece of equipment that every Asian household throughout Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, etc., all had this one measure. And so you could actually now have the distribution of recipes based around the can measure. And that's the, that's the way I learned to cook when I was young. We, we would use can measures for those kind of things when my grandma was making a cake, for example. But even though the history and the coming into being of cupcakes and muffins it could not be more different, it's not really where it ends. So I have to move to the second way of answering the question, which is probably the more scientific way, composition and technique. It uh, is coincidental that when I first got the email about this topic, I happened to be standing next to Ben Shuri from Attica. And I'm not kidding, I got the email on my phone, I thought, well, I've got one of Australia's best chefs right next to me, I should probably ask him. And I said, Ben, what is the difference between a cupcake and a muffin? And he thought about it for about five seconds, he looked me in the eye and he said, Adam, a, cup, a cupcake is never savoury and a muffin is never iced. Which is bloody good, it's a brilliant definition. You know, you, you actually can't get much better than that. And before I started researching it, I thought that's great. But then after I researched it, I was like, well, this is still pretty much the best first line definition of the difference between a muffin and cupcake and I can, I can come to. If it's savoury, it's a muffin. If it's got icing on it, it's a cupcake. But of course that's not the end of the story because there are many sweet things that you can eat that are not iced that could be either a muffin or a cupcake so we have to get a bit technical. There are lots of compositional differences between a muffin and a cupcake and there are lots of compositional differences within the realm of muffins and within the realm of cupcakes but you may not be able to notice them even in the finished product, maybe, maybe even in tasting it. So we should probably get rid of some of the myths first. What are the properties that people think are the difference between a muffin and a cupcake that actually aren't? Firstly, size. You can have mini muffins, you can have big cupcakes, it doesn't really matter. The amount of sweetness. Some people think cupcakes are sweeter than muffins, but it's not true at all. You can have muffins that are much sweeter than cupcakes as long as your cupcake is not going savoury. Leavening agent. Both yeast and baking powder can be used in either muffins or cupcakes. So it's not very common to have yeast in a cupcake, for example, but it's possible. Although muffins will generally use more leaveners, and I'll explain why in a moment. Paper cup, both can have that. And then you get to fat, and fat is the one thing people are like, oh yes, you know, uh, cupcakes are always have a much higher proportion of fat to flour, not true at all. You can have a sponge cupcake that contains no fat whatsoever. Uh, the presence of a top, sometimes uh, you know, a muffin might have a big top on it because it's got the extra leaveners in there. You can also have mini muffins that have no top on them at all, and that's because the, the, as the size goes down, it's actually uh, related to both the modelling of dinosaurs and shipbuilding, that when you decrease the volume of something, uh, you decrease in three dimensions, and you decrease the surface area in only two. And so uh, when you're changing the size of something like a cupcake or a muffin, you have to do different calculations to get 
to what's called the Froud number. If you want to get into that later, we can possibly do, but <laughs> let's not. So the one big difference between a muffin and a cupcake is the one ingredient that people don't even consider to be an ingredient, but it is the most important ingredient and the difference between these two things that we're talking about. It's air. Muffins involve the combination of wet and dry ingredients with minimal mixing. This inhibits the development of gluten and it gives you a more coarse crumb. There is no incorporation of air into the mix at all. Cupcakes, however, will always incorporate a step that is designed to trap air into a batter. If you make a cake, you, many recipes will start by creaming together the sugar and the butter. You may not think that involves air, but you can see the colour of the butter lightening and the volume increasing as the sugar dissolves into the butter. It traps tiny molecules, well not molecules, to pockets of air within the batter and that's what allows you to get this dense and even crumb. Even if it's not a butter cake or a pound cake, you'll often start by, say if you're making a, a genoise or a sponge, you'll be whipping eggs. And so anything that's trapping air into that cake batter is going to give you a cake rather than a bread, which is something that you don't get with muffins, showing kind of where they've come from. So that's the technical difference, really. It's air. But that's still not the end of the story because we haven't got to the most important difference yet, and that's the cultural difference. I guess the most illuminating part of the discussion is between a muffin and a cupcake, we never actually have any trouble deciding which is which. You know, if you ask the question in abstract, you might go, well, I don't really know the answer to that. But in the heat of the moment, we're always fine. Nobody ever goes and orders a muffin and then stops going, oh my God, this is a cupcake, you've lied to me. <laughs> but we intuitively know by its context and by its taste, what's a muffin and what's a, context, uh, a cupcake. If you're at a child's birthday party and someone brings out something with a candle on it, that's a cupcake. If you see someone in gym clothes and a yoga mat coming out of a bakery, they probably just bought a muffin. If it's a business meeting, you're serving muffins. If it's a baby shower, it's cupcakes. If it's breakfast, it's a muffin. If it's a sit-down afternoon tea, definitely cupcakes. And these are, these are rules. These are actually rules because if you try and switch them around, you can see how farcical it becomes. If you tell people that you had a muffin for breakfast, they're like, oh, you've got your whole life together. How do I get so successful and vivacious? <laughs> but if you tell them you had a cupcake for breakfast, it's like saying you woke up fully closed, face down, face down in a pool of your own vomit, and they're calling your friends to arrange an intervention. <laughs> for something that's compositionally so similar, we've attributed roles to muffins and cupcakes that are completely unassailable. It's a kind of natural brand recognition at work. We have two things that have come from the complete opposite ends of spectrums. It's muffins began their journey as a nutritious and ingenious solution to the provision of daily bread. Cupcakes began as a way for lazy people to eat more cake. But <laughs> over decades and centuries of evolution, they've kind of come together in the middle, but their identities are still completely separate. A muffin is, is healthy, it's active, it's nutritious, it's the healthy version of you in the Booper commercial. But a cupcake is decadent and saccharine and celebratory, and it's the five-year-old you in a pink dress at a birthday party. The roles that we assign to food are an enormous part of our culture, and the words that we give those roles are hugely effective. They may be historically and compositionally next to meaningless, but they're culturally very persuasive. If you look at any packet of processed food or any restaurant menu, you see a lot of words that don't actually mean a lot, natural, wellness, goodness, you know, what does goodness mean? Healthy is one of the words that we see so often related to food, but have you ever stopped to think about just how meaningless that is? It tells you nothing about the food, it tells you even less about the science that's used to justify it. It doesn't say what's healthy, does it mean it contains no gluten, is that healthy? Does it mean that it's low in calories? What if you need more calories to be healthy? Menus have words like local and seasonal and fresh. Fresh is something that we would ordinarily not even dispute as being something that is desirable in food, but isn't it ridiculous to have that on a menu? It tells you nothing about the quality or condition of the ingredients of your tomatoes or milk or fish beyond the fact that it's not rancid. It's like saying our food is not dangerously rotten and we consider that to be a positive. <laughs> How do you feel when you buy biodynamic yogurt? That feels really good, doesn't it? <laughs> Biodynamic is a great sounding word, but the main tent pole of biodynamic farming involves burying the horn of a dead cow, 
filled with cow manure under a full moon in autumn, letting it decompose over winter and then exhuming it in the spring. The most common biodynamic farming compost, and I'll read this so I get it exactly right, is created by yarrow blossoms are stuffed into the urinary bladders of red deer, placed in the sun during summer, buried in earth during winter and retrieved in the spring. I shit you not, biodynamic farming is 100% witchcraft, but for some reason we all love it. We have no problem. Google it, it'll blow your mind. It's so crazy. But I don't want to get too far off track because I think we've actually answered our question. Muffins and cupcakes arose by any other name. They're historically different, compositionally similar, distinguished in technique, mainly by the air that we breathe, but culturally completely separate, and that's the difference. So if you were the person who sent this question in, I firstly have to apologize for hating your question so completely in the beginning. I hope you found the answer to be satisfactory, but also thank you for reintroducing me to something that I had forgotten, and that's the art of being inquisitive for the sake of inquisitiveness itself. And I have to say I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. And we're doing questions too, so if you have one, please put your hand up. Oh, a freon. <laughs> uh, um, freons are cakes of a different shape, similar kind of history to a cupcake. But again, a cupcake is uh, a freon is never iced. So thank you, Ben Shuri. I saw that on the Interiobank website and I was like, I'm going to work this out mathematically by taking the surface area of a dead bird, the surface area of uh, human society on Earth and the understanding that we don't actually inhabit that much of, our, uh, of the land that we live on. So I, I did try and work it out and I know that we see a lot of live birds. I don't know anything about bird behavior. So I don't know if it's like a cat and they go off somewhere to die and then you just don't see it again until you smell it some weeks later. But I think that they're just all around us but we don't see them because human beings have a very small footprint on the earth. So they could, sometimes you see them on the, the road when they're hit by a, a, a car or something, but more often than not, they're just falling in spots where we don't really go. Thank you very much. <laughs> if anyone else has an answer to that question, please let me know because where the hell do they go, dead birds? Um, if someone set you a challenge to make a savory cupcake, where would you go? Ooh. Um, get out of my house, no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you could. Savory cakes don't really exist because I think, you know, it's a, it's a matter of terminology. You're kind of starting to get out of the realm of cakes and into what even would a savoury cake be? Okay, so if we're, if we're defining a cake as something that's incorporating air into the leaven, leavening process to obtain a fine crumb without the undue development of gluten, it's kind of like pasta, you know? Um, you, you're kind of... No, but you're developing more of the pasta, uh, the gluten in pasta. But um, yeah, you're getting into like, like these these oat cakes and, and those kind of things. And so I think you're probably going to move out of the realm of cupcake, and you'll end up with something that looks a lot like I don't know a, a focaccia. <laughs> Was it actually interesting, was it? <laughs> it was. Um, but uh, I was wondering, but it's uh, relevant in the Western context, but would there be anything similar, say, in the East Asian context, the Japanese? Um, wheat flour is not 
much used, say, in, in Japan. The, the Probably the most common wheat flour cake that you'd find in Japan came from the Portuguese influence. It's called a castella, um, obviously from the Portuguese word for castle, came in through Nagasaki in around the 1600s. And that's actually a really interesting cake because it's a sweet cake, but it's made with a high gluten flour, something that you might use for bread because um, you do have Japanese wheat flours. They weren't produced in the amount of volume that you would uh, use to make bread or something, for example, and actually the native Japanese wheats were very low in gluten, um, so they're not particularly good for making bread. So they're good for tempura, for example. You'd use a, a very low gluten flour to make tempura batter, which would make it more crispy and, and those kind of things, but terrible for making bread, uh, terrible really for making noodles as well, unless you're starting to add other things like lye water and things to it. Um, so the castella that came into Japan from the Portuguese was using Portuguese style bread flour uh, to make a cake that is extremely dense uh, but not dry. It's, it's fluffy, it doesn't contain any other leaveners. I don't think, from memory, the, the recipe certainly doesn't contain yeast. I don't think it contains bicarbonate of soda or anything either. You, you whip eggs a lot for like 15 minutes um, to almost create create like a Swiss meringue and then you fold the flour through that and then bake it and it's very buttery and it's very, it, it's like a, a genoise really more than a, a, a cake but Asia is not big on baking, you know, even modern day Japanese uh, kitchens don't have ovens. When I lived there for years and years I, I just learned to cook without an oven because I, they don't have ovens there. Um, uh, I'm trying to think most other Asian countries don't have ovens either so the, the sweets that you get um, in Asian countries tend to be either fresh or set you know set with agar agar or gelatin or uh, something refrigerated so rather than um, something baked scientific <laughs> Objectively, um, uh, blueberry for muffins, uh, clearly. Cupcakes, um, I would say probably a standard butter cake recipe because you've got to have something that's in cupcake form. This, this actually gets back to our shipbuilding and surface area question before. In cupcake form, if you, you know, sponge cupcakes or a Genoise cupcake, uh, delicious, absolutely delicious, don't hold for very long because then the volume of the cupcake is so now so much smaller than, say, a large sponge cake, so it dries out much more quickly because it doesn't have uh, a lot of fat in it. It doesn't have any fat in it if, you, if you're making it the, the traditional way. So you've got this now much larger surface area of your cupcake that is going to dry out and actually go stale far more quickly when you're doing these kind of spongy or, or low, low fat type versions. The, the standard pound cake, you know, if you, uh, you've heard of a pound cake, the, similar to cupcakes being from the cup measure, pound cakes uh, existed are called that because the measurements are one pound butter, one pound flour, one pound eggs, etc. So they're very dense, very very fatty, but also very um, uh, resistant to going stale because staleness is basically water going away. So by reducing the amount of water that you have in your mixture by increasing the amount of fat, you're actually getting a cupcake that's going to stay uh, for longer. Uh, stay fresh for longer. So certainly for cupcakes, the way it's kind of evolved is that you have to have, more, more commonly you have a much higher fat, so a butter cake or a pound cake type mix going to that, so scientifically on that case. Muffins on the other hand, you're, you're kind of more open there. I personally think that having some fruit in a muffin is a good thing or even uh, vegetables if you're going more savoury because again you get the, the ability, it's a surface area thing because you've, you've got the fruit then that can hold moisture and, and give its moisture up to the cake as it starts to go stale and let it actually keep for a bit longer. I can't believe we're getting so many questions about muffins and cupcakes. This was, <laughs> this was unexpected. <laughs> Excellent. What's your, what's food trend that you fed up 
all of them. Um, I'm really not big on food trends at all. I don't think uh, I don't think they add a lot other than novelty. And to me, food's not about novelty. There are huge issues that the world has with food, rather than indulging the novelties of uh, a very privileged few of us. Um, one one food trend that I just don't get though is Korean fried chicken. You know, I. Everyone I've spoken to loves Korean fried chicken. To me, it tastes exactly the same as, you know, bad food court Chinese that you got in the mid 80s. And I, I just, you know, and then I looked at, for all the best recipes for Korean fried chicken to understand maybe I've just, every time I've had it, had terrible versions of it, but they're all the same. And it is actually basically the exact same recipe as creating a spicy version of honey chicken from 1982. It's, it's, it's weird to me that that's become popular. Um, Tacos, another one. Don't really get those either. I like tacos, don't get me wrong, but uh, when we start to have the great Australian pub and you can't get a palmy because they're all serving terrible, terrible, terrible tacos, that, that, uh, that, 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 this is my problem. It's not that tacos are being served, it's that the tacos that are being served are just so very bad everywhere and they're all the same it's like oh yes some pork and a pineapple chutney awesome and then some chipotle beef great that's weird to me you know we have a great food culture in australia and we 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 seem to be so ingrained in australian cultural cringe that we're willing to put up with terrible versions of tacos in, instead of you know our own food which is very good Would I line up for a restaurant? I did yesterday. I was lined up for some ramen, not for very long. Um, uh, but yeah, you know, I don't. Uh, it's pretty common through Asia to line up for restaurants, mainly because of the size of restaurants. They tend to be a bit smaller, um, and because the when you're lining up for a restaurant you're lining up for a dish. You know, it's it's not like, I've heard the chef here is really great, so I'm gonna stand outside for three hours. You, if you line up for wonton mee in, in Malaysia, you're lining up to get that wonton mee. Even if that restaurant serves other things, you're only gonna order the one thing. If you're lining up for ramen, you're going there for a particular bowl of ramen. So it's not really lining up for restaurants, it's lining up for particular dishes. And that's that's kind of, I think that's really important. You know, the Michelin guide is one thing, but the 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 ethos of it from its very beginning was one star was because uh, it was you know it was a tire company. Well, it still is a tire company, but one star was uh, when you're on your journey. One, a one star restaurant is something that you should stop at if you're going by. A two star restaurant is that you should detour to go to it, and a three star restaurant is something that you should take a special trip to go and see. And I guess I personally think that um, that rating system has kind of lost some of that charm because, and, and it, it does kind of still ring true because if you're going to say three starred Fat Duck, for example, people will take a special trip to go to Bray or to England or to the other side of the world to, to eat there. If you're going to Noma, you might uh, make a special trip to go there. That's only two stars, but that's probably got more to do with the politics of France versus Denmark than it does the, the quality of the restaurant. Um, but even I, I was just in Malaysia last week and my uncle was saying, he, you know, he just said, do, do you want to go and eat some beef no noodles in Surumban? And I was in Kuala Lumpur. And Surumban is a good three hour drive from Kuala Lumpur. And I was like, really? You were going to drive there for beef noodles? Like, why not? And we didn't go because Michael's a bit weird, <laughs> but that you know, I I don't have any problem with travelling great distances for food, and and I think it's uh, something that is uh, fun and to be appreciated. It's not simple. I was thinking about this for days. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming, everyone.